understand where you're at. And, and so for the last few months, um, I think I've shared with you, uh, I have been working on uh, a thing which is called a mental health coach. And what a mental health coach is, is a lot of times what ends up happening is in churches, we are not very good at, at, at treating people. For instance, uh, some churches, if you go to, as a matter of fact, my wife and my daughter uh, both have epilepsy, okay, and they have seizures. Um, Diana is controlled, Charlie is controlled, but if my wife and my daughter were alive during the times of the Bible, they would have been basically cast out, or basically they would have been stoned, uh, because they would be, in the Bible, you will see that they have people which they call demon-possessed. And in the biblical times, they didn't understand what epilepsy was all about. And they just assumed it was demon possession. There are churches today that you go to if you suffer with depression, if you suffer with addictions. Uh, they will try to do exorcisms on you because they believe that you are possessed. And unfortunately, a lot of times what people in church do not understand, and that is this, that depression is, can be genetic because the further and further that we get away from perfect, the more we get. And so a lot of times it's like this. So what happens a lot of times in church is they have no idea how to handle this. They don't know what to do. And so they just basically say, okay, here, just do this, do that. And, and so what's happening is people are realizing that, hold on a minute. Uh, you're sending people here, here, and here, but you're not really giving them scriptural counseling. You're just sending them out on their own and just do whatever. And, and yet that is not correct. So been working on this for the last few months, and finally this weekend, I finally finished it, which now I am certified as a mental health coach, which means that I can actually hang a shingle and actually do mental health coaching for people who are having mental health issues, addictions, depression, uh, post-traumatic syndrome, um, PTSD, uh, other things that are out there that people are dealing with. And I put it out that basically it is no charge. It is absolutely free. You want to come, I'll try my best to help you. And if I can't help you, then I have got a network of people that I work with uh, that can, okay? And, and during this, there was a scripture that I had read a long time ago. And, and because um, I, I suffer with panic attacks, okay? And my panic attacks are, are based upon water. I still have no clue why. We grew up next to the river. We played in the river. We walked across a dam, didn't know how to swim, and, and, and all kinds of stupid stuff. But yet, a few years ago, we were, uh, Diana and I and Michael and Charlie, we were out in Las Vegas. We'd gone out there, and we were driving from Las Vegas to uh, Williams, Arizona, to basically go catch a train to go to uh, Grand Canyon. And I had to go across the Hoover Dam, okay? This was, you were still allowed to drive across it. So I went at night, early in the morning, so I didn't know what was around me. But coming back that night, I started realizing I'm getting closer and closer to that dam. And it got to the point where I just had to pull over. Because Diana and them asked me, they said, are you okay? And I don't know if you've ever seen white knuckles on a steering column. And that was my white knuckles on the steering column. I was petrified. I did not think that I was going to make it. So I pulled over. And, uh, and, and I said, uh, I, I can't do this, Michael. You drive. And so Michael got out and, and, and drove. Um, I go on cruises. Okay? I will look straight out at the water, but don't get me near the rail. Uh, if you ever want to get killed... Act like you're going to push me off of something. I will take you down. And if I go over, you will go over with me. I guarantee you. That's how much I love you. We'll go together. And, and I do, you, you know. And, and I suffer with those things too. And, and does that mean that, that God doesn't love me? I got some scriptures I want to show you. 
Because there's a lot of you right now that are dealing with um, not feeling like you're worth anything. And as I was going through this and, and I getting close to finishing this week, I ran back across this scripture that um, I had kind of forgot about a little story that was tucked away in the Old Testament, called, and it was in the book of Zechariah, and it's chapter 3. So if you've got them up there, um, bring them up, and, and let's read it, okay? It was prior to this. Then he showed me the high priest Joshua. Now, this is not the same Joshua who fit or fought the battle of Jericho. This is another Joshua, okay, who was standing before the angel of the Lord, with Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. Satan is standing, ladies and gentlemen, and accusing you of a lot of things. And a lot of times, you're believing what he's saying. You're not worth anything. Nobody loves you, this or that or whatever. And, and he's filling you full of lies. But here's what the Lord said to Satan. The Lord rebuke you, Satan. May the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Isn't this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? Now, that's what God thinks. But now look at this, at verse number three. Now, Joshua was dressed with filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. Remember, we talk about we're nothing but a sinner in filthy rags. These filthy clothes, you need to understand something about these filthy clothes. Basically, these filthy clothes that he's Joshua is wearing is basically clothes that has the garbage of the world on it. Um, in other words, it, it's called a, a, a nice, I don't know, what would be the right word to use other than poop. That's what it is. His clothes has got excre excrement. Okay, if you want to use a $50 word, but let's just go back to what we understand, poop. He's got all of this stuff on him, and he's standing before the Lord. And this is what Satan makes you think you look like. And you're standing before God, and he's accusing you of everything that's going wrong in your life. You aren't worth anything. So the angel, the angel of the Lord spoke to those standing before him, and look at what they said. Take off his filthy clothes. Then he said to him, see, I have removed your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with what? Festive robes. Remember what it says in the Bible? It says that there is joy in the presence of the angels when a lost person comes to know the Lord. That's your party, ladies and gentlemen. What God does is he takes off all of the filthy rags and puts on festive robes just like the father of the prodigal son. Because God's throwing a party in your honor. And when Satan comes before God to say, hey, this guy isn't worth a dime. Not worth anything. God says, no, he's my child. And he says, so the angel of the Lord spoke to him, take off the filthy clothes. And he said to him, see, I've removed your iniquities from you. And I will clothe you with festive robes. Then I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. So a clean turban was placed on his head. They clothed him in garments while the angel of the Lord was standing nearby. Then the angel of the Lord charged Joshua. This is what the Lord of the armies said. 
If you walk in my way and you keep my mandates or keep my laws, he says, you will both rule my house and take care of my courts. I will also grant you access among these who are standing here. You know what I have? I have access to God along with the angels. You know what you have? You have access to the king of kings and the Lord of lords. You have access to the creator of all things. You have creator to Yahweh, to Jehovah. He says this. He says, listen, high priest Joshua. You and your colleagues sitting before you, indeed, these men are a sign that I am about to bring my servant, the branch, Jesus. He says, notice the stone that I've set before Joshua. On the one stone are seven eyes. I will engrave an inscription on this. This is the declaration of the Lord of armies. I will take away the iniquity of this land in a single day. And on that day, each of you will invite his neighbor to sit under his vine in a fig tree, and this is the declaration of the Lord of the armies. I don't know about you, but what I found out this week is I got reminded, you know what? I really don't care what anybody thinks about me. Because I am a child of the king. He has put on some really cool clothes, you know? It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks Eh, whatever. I don't have filthy rags anymore. And when I stand before God, none of those filthy rags and none of this garbage that the world offers and that, I, that we all get caught up with in and all of this stuff, it ain't there. It's gone. And, and so this morning, it leads us into a point because one, we've been talking about the Lord is my shepherd and, and I don't need anything. I've got everything. I don't need anything at all. And so what everybody else thinks about you doesn't really matter. It's what does he think. And that's what he thinks about every one of you. And so what I need to tell you is this. Quit believing lies. Satan is lying to you, is lying to you, is lying to you. The only one that will ever tell you the truth is Jesus. And you know what? He's the only one that matters. It really doesn't matter at the end of the day what anybody else thought about me in this life. What matters is what did he think about me. And this is where I need to tell you that you need to live an anointed life. And this is where we're going this morning. So hang on. Uh, You had uh, outlines out out in the back. If you don't have, if you didn't get one, uh, they were laying on the table. Uh, You will... Let me just tell you up front, if you want outlines, you want to talk it, talk it over, I will always place them on the table right there by the TV, right outside, right, right across from the Welcome Center. It's right there, always will be every Sunday, okay? And if you don't have any from the other ones and you need it, let me know and I'll, I'll print them out, okay? So we're, ta- we're talking about this. And so in Psalms chapter 23, in verse number 5, we're going to look at just one phrase in that whole thing. And it says this. He says, you anoint my head with oil. Now, when we look at this, you've got to understand, this was written about 3,000 years ago. And so from the 3,000 years to now, it's what does it mean and, and, and what does it say? Because it, it's like this. You're... Your neighbor could come up to you tomorrow and bring a bottle of oil over to your house and take that oil and put it on your head or on your body or whatever, and they could say, I anoint you the king of rock and roll. I can anoint you the king of this or the queen of that. And, and let me say this, what, what, what does that make you? makes you nothing, okay? Because why? They don't have the authority to anoint you and make you the king of rock and roll. 
They don't have the authority to call you anything. Okay? And, and, and so what happens is, would that change your life? Not really. Because why? Somebody just said something to you, but they don't have authority to tell you that. Somebody could come up to you right now, and as much as you don't like the person that's in the White House right now, somebody could come up to you right now and say, okay, I think you would make a better person than that person that's in the White House right now, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to anoint you and declare you the President of the United States. And you know what that means? Nothing. You're still going to be living here, and he's still going to be living at 1611... uh, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Okay, I, I actually, I actually moved him last night. <laughs> I moved him down the block a little bit because I think he goes real well in the Capitol building <laughs> with all of those people. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm in a good, I'm in a good mood. So what you need to understand is, is this: if we want to understand what it means to be anointed, okay, we've got to have a definition. And and, and here's the definition, okay. There is an an anointed by God, okay, and that is internal, okay. And then there's an anointed by people, and that is external. And you'll see scripture as it begins to talk about these. And so when it says that You anointed my head with oil. He starts talking about, number one, being anointed by God. What that means is something is going to happen internally. We talked part about it last week. What's happening is internally. When you and I became a child of God, he anointed us internally. He gave us his Holy Spirit, which was his anointing that he placed upon it. And, and what it does is this. When God placed the Holy Spirit that you and I have within us, it gives us insight. It gives us ability to see things and understand some things. And one of the things that it also is, it gives us really, whether you realize it or not, it also gives you supernatural powers. Did you ever think about that? Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. I and you have supernatural powers within us. And the problem is we don't believe it. (laughs) Yeah, we're still trying to figure out how to use it. And so many times what happens is it's... It's God has planted those within us, and it's also a protection that God is giving you and I that you normally don't have. Why? Because we're his children. And his Holy Spirit is to protect us. He, we've been talking. He's our shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. His job is protection. And so his supernatural ability that he has given us is to protect us, not to harm us. And so many times we forget about this because God has chosen each and every one of you to do something. He chose you to do that even before you and I were born. God had a plan for you, and he chose you to do that, and he has given you supernatural ability to be able to do that. But what we believe is, I can't do it. I just can't do it. And as long as you continue with that mindset that I can't do that, you're not going to do that. But what I got a mindset is, I quit. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to point at you. <laughs> I just like picking people out of the, out, out, just pointing at them. But what I understand is this. With God, I can do all things because he has given us that anointed. And 
Now, when you start talking about anointed by people, that's something else. Because that's when people will prayerfully, basically, will take olive oil, it's what it is, and basically will anoint you with it. Maybe on your skin, maybe on your forehead, your body, whatever, okay? And, and sometimes you need to understand that God also gives us external symbols about anointing. Communion is one. We just took that on Wednesday night, okay? And sometimes people do not understand that communion is an external symbol of the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, okay? When he says, this is my body, this is my blood, using, you know, some people would use bread and wine, uh, some will use crackers and juice, and, and, and it's just a sign. It's an outward sign of an inward spiritual truth. Now, there are some religions that believe that when you eat the, the bread and when you drink the wine, that the bread actually goes into your body and becomes the body of Christ. And when you drink the wine, that it goes into your body and it actually becomes the blood of Jesus, okay? There are some that believe that. I talk to them sometime, okay? It's the same thing when someone is baptized. You put them under the water and you bring them back up. That is an external symbol of something that has happened internally. And, and so sometimes we, for, we forget about these things. You, you know, it's, it's like, you know, I, I've been born again. I, I, and, and born again, may I say this to you, that doesn't mean that I turned over a new leaf. Okay? Because let me say this to you. There are some things that you used to do before you got saved that you will probably do again after you got saved. You, what do you mean? Well, let's take somebody who has uh, alcoholic, alcoholism. They get saved. Okay? Everything's fallen in line, then all of a sudden, the whole world falls apart on them. They lose a mom. They lose a dad. They lose a child. They lose a friend. And they don't know how, how to deal with that. How do, how do I deal with that loss and that grief? The only way that I know how to deal with that pain was to take a drink out of the bottle. Does that make them lost? No. It makes them human. Does God say, I'm sorry, you're going to hell now because you did that? No, he doesn't. Why? Because he forgave you of all your sins. What he's saying is okay. I'm not saying it's okay, but what I'm saying is this. Do you understand that you sinned? And the Holy Spirit tells you that you have. And guess what he does? He holds you in his arms, and he consoles you, and gives you strength to be able to get up and walk again. Because that's his anointing. But so many times as Christians, we eat. We eat our children. We criticize them. We're saying, oh, you did that. When at the same time, they're doing stuff. You know, I, my, my big one was when I was growing up. You know, they would not stand up in the pulpit and preach about smoking. Why? Because half the congregation smoked. Okay, so they're not going to tell you that. But they would, you know, get up in the pulpit and preach about alcoholism and saying, don't you know that your body is the temple of the Lord and you shouldn't be putting that stuff in there. And at the same time, you would sit down at, at, a, at, at a, a potluck dinner and they would eat a whole chicken. And you could tell it because their belt, it, they had Dunlap disease, where their stomach is already done lapped over your belt, 
And they would stand up and they would criticize people. And at the same time, and, and, and what God is saying is this, none of us are perfect. We've all got our little pet peeves of things that we think are right and things that we think are wrong. And we ain't God. It is not my job to judge you. It is my job to keep me in check. And my job to come alongside of you and walk with you and help you. That's why he says, bear one another's burdens, because that's what we're supposed to do. So we need to understand something, and that is this. You need to understand, when you got saved, all my sins were washed away. The penalty for those sins is gone. Jesus paid it. He forgave me. Now, when I do sin, is there discipline? Yes, there is discipline. But as I've been telling you the last couple of weeks, there is a difference between discipline and punishment. And if you don't know the difference between punishment and discipline, you need to look it up. And you'll understand that God doesn't punish his children. He disciplines his children because he loves us. And would never, that's why the Bible says that God doesn't tempt us with sin or evil, okay? And I hear people all the time, threw this at me, made me sin. No, he didn't. And, and so we need to understand these things. Now, there's some other uh, outward anointings, okay? Um, this is not the same ring. It's kind of a, a facsimile of the same ring that... Almost 50 years ago, in 19 and 7, May the 12th, 1972, and it'll be 50 years if we live this long, uh, to make it to May the 12th of this year, that Diane and I will be have married for 50 years. And this ring is a sign of communion between her and, and me. Okay? Now, does that mean that we're always happy? No, there are some times that she gets ticked off at me. Okay? And there are other times I get ticked off and I walk away because I know best, you know, that there are certain things in life that you learn. One is you never argue with a woman. Okay? I, I, I see these men that just sit down and argue and I think, what are you doing? You can't win. You, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy. This is a losing battle. And I'll ask them, how long have you been married? Oh, five years. And I say, <laughs> it shows. It shows. But, but what happens is, as, as you begin to understand with the communion, it, you, you, you begin to love each other. And after a while, you, you, you figure out, you're not the same person you were 50 years ago. Thank God. Because he had other plans for you, okay? And, 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 he, and he does those things. And, and, and so a lot of times we need to understand what God is, what God is saying, okay? Now, when someone is anointed by oil, okay, and, 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 and when we do this, it's like a symbol of saying that God approves, okay? And, and you, you see it all through the, all through the Bible. And... What would happen is back in the time of Christ or, or prior to the time of Christ, what they would do is they would take the oil out and the king would anoint people. The king would do this or the high priest would do this. Well, when Jesus came along and he gave his life on the cross, he broke that old system because he's our high priest and he's interceding. And he's already done the anointing. And he's anointed each and every one of us. And so the thing of it is, I don't have to go to a priest anymore to get anointed. I've already got one. And, and I know where he's at, okay? I never have to question, which house is he in today? Because I know exactly where he's at. And all I have to do is call on him, and he's, and, and he's right there. And it doesn't matter what time of the day or anything else. And, and so what we need to, 
to understand is when he says that you anointed my, my head with oil, you need to go back to the basics. And, and let me say this to, to you. The basics is this, ladies and gentlemen, you are not an accident. Not at all. You are perfectly planned. And God laid it all out. And he, and, he, and he did this, okay? So when you look at the Bible and, and it talks about what God has planned for your life, it, it's called your calling, okay? And the word calling in the Latin or Greek, it, 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 it is a, a kalo, K-A-L-E-O, which means to call out or in Latin, it is called voice, or V-O-C-E, which is where we get the word vocal, or vocalized, okay, in there. So what it means is this. You may be called to be something in, the, in this life, okay? You may be a taxi tr- a driver, a banker, an investor, homemaker, teacher, or whatever it is. So every one of us, has a calling on our life. There were times, and, and, and I think I've shared it with you, I knew from a very early age what I was going to do when I got older. Okay? At the age of 10, um, I got saved. And did I know I was going to preach? There were some things back there that said, yeah, I would do that. Okay, but also in my other aspect of my life, there was another calling, and I knew that. I was in the, I was in the eighth grade, and they started doing career paths, okay, and, and, and so they said, okay, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to work with computers, and this was eighth grade, how old was I? 69, uh, 14. Okay, so I was 14 years old seeing the counselor. The counselor says, what are you going to do when you get out of school? I'm going to work with computers. That's what I'm going to do. And and they said, well, in order to do that, you need to take math. Okay, seventh grade. And and so what did they do? Eighth grade, I got to take Algebra 1. It was pre-advanced, okay, that that if if you were in a certain level of, of math, you got to take it. So I got to take it because why? Math was my subject. Okay, don't ask me about English, don't ask me about literature, okay, history, I loved history, but don't ask me about science and all of this other stuff, you know, chemistry and that stuff. All I know is there are signs for all of the elements, but I have no clue what they are. Uh, you, you know, I could, I could probably tell you that H is for hydrogen and, and, and uh, O is for oxygen, and so H2O, H2O means two, two atoms of hydrogen mixed with one atom of, of oxygen, and that gives you water, Okay. And, and I learned that back in my prior life. But anyway, so you got, so God had a calling. And, and, and guess what? I did that up until about six years ago. It'll be six years in April. That's what I did my whole life. That was my calling. And, and, and what happened? Because out of that calling, I also ended up preaching and pastoring. But can I also tell you? I also made friends along the way. And guess what? My pastoral life and my business life were not two separate lives. They were one. Because there were many times a lot of people knew that I was a pastor. And they knew that I was a Christian. And they say, at lunchtime, can I talk to you? Or hey, I know you believe in prayer. Can you pray for my mom, my dad, my kids? I absolutely. I still have them today messaging me off of, off of Facebook. Hey, Chuck, I, I know we don't see each other anymore, but can you pray for my, for my mom, my dad? They're really struggling right now. I say, absolutely. Absolutely. As I was sharing with you, I... Um, just did a funeral of a, of a young lady that I met when she was nine years old who moved from uh, Manchester, Kentucky to Hamilton, Ohio. 
And we lost sight of each other during the years. And then she died and her husband said, hey, can, can you come do the funeral? You knew her. And we did. We had a good time. And we shared with each other. Out of that, I made some more friends. You, you know? And, and, and some of them listened and some of them don't. So anyway, in, in, the Bible says in, in, in Ephesians chapter 2, in verse number 10, it says, God made us what we are. He wired you that way. There are so many times we ask ourselves, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? He wired you that way. He made you. Okay? And, and, and what it is, is you can't fulfill those things that God wants you to do on your own. So let's go. Number one, when God appoints me, he anoints me. And this is the first thing that we need to understand. And, and that is this. God will never ask you to do anything that he has not provided you the mechanism in which to do it. If you're out there doing something and you're really struggling and you're really struggling and you're really struggling, you need to ask yourself this question. Am I trying to do this on myself or am I trying to do this because you want me to, God? And when I find out that, yes, this is what you want me to do, God, I find out the path gets a little bit easier. Satan is going to blast you. Yes, understand that. Because he does not want you to do the will of God. Because let me tell you something. A person who does the will of God is going to be a happy person. Does that mean that everything is going to be hunky-dory? No. But I don't have to be hunky-dory to be happy. Because you know what? I know that I'm doing what the Father wants me to do, and he finds pleasure in that. And me making my Father happy, that makes me happy. When I know that I'm pleasing him. And so in 1 Thessalonians in chapter 5, verse number 24, 24 says, The one who calls you, that's God, is faithful and he will do it. So get out of the way. If he's called you, he's going to do it. Because that's what he wants. In Acts chapter 1, verse number 8, to the 12 disciples, look at what he says. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes, to you, comes on you. That's anointing. And what did he say? You will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. And guess what? The disciples today are his witnesses to the ends of the earth. Guess what? So are you and so am I. There are today, today you can get on Facebook and you can start talking about Jesus and you can take that message to the whole world. You can get up and do it on TikTok. Okay, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend it. Okay, but do it on YouTube. Do it, do it on Facebook. Just go out there. You can do it. Why? Because he has called you to do these things. We need to understand them. He says, you will be my witnesses. So, let me say this to you. There was no way that Jesus, in his form, as one man, could go to the ends of the earth. So you know what he did? He called us to do it. And you know what he said? He said, you will do greater things than me. Every time I get up in the morning and I just start scrolling through my news feed on, on, on my uh, Facebook page, I just start picking and choosing things. Well, this looks good. This looks good. Oh, this is funny. That'll, that'll help somebody out. I'll have a good day. All of these things. And I, and I put these things out, okay? Um, the, the one from uh, Wednesday when we went to see mom, okay? I went to see, see my mother. That and, and, and some of the other ones. You, you know how many people around the world have already seen this thing? They don't even know my mom. And they're wishing her happy birthday. They, they just know they're friends of ours. Or a friend of a friend. I got, I got some on there that I started looking at. And I thought, who is this person? I don't even know them. 
And I go to look, and they ain't a friend of nobody that I know. It just showed up. Somehow, somewhere, it showed up. And I think, this is cool. My mom is getting a happy birthday wish from people in Australia, in, in, in England, places she, she's never been. And they're telling her, why? Because we've got the capability to do that, which Jesus didn't have the capability to do. He's using us as vessels to do this through his anointing. Number two, God's anointing makes me and you a better person. Maybe you think, you know what, I'm good right now. But let me say this to you. When you get the, the anoint, anointing from Jesus, it will make you better. 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse number 1. Then Samuel took oil and poured it on Saul's head. Okay? And he said, God has anointed you to be the leader of his people. And then what he did in the next few verses after that, he began to start telling Saul, here's what you're going to do, Saul. Boom, 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 boom. And all of these things Saul had the capability to do because he had the anointing of God over him. But because he got jealous of David, he lost all of the things that God had anointed him to do. And the next thing you know, the people that loved Saul now hated Saul. Because they were out there saying, oh, yeah, Saul, we want David. We want David. We don't want Saul. And Saul became so jealous and enraged. And all of the things that God had planned for his life lost. And sometimes we need to understand that's the way it is in our lives. Because God has so much, so much he wanted to give to us. And we lose it because we don't recognize what it is that he's wanting us to do. We want to do it. Elvis's way, my way, okay? But we need to understand. 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse number 6 says, God's spirit will come on you in power, and you'll speak like a prophet. You will be changed into a different person. You'll, and after this happens, do whatever you think is best because God will be with you. So guess what? When God puts his Holy Spirit in you, on you, in the anointing, ladies and gentlemen, you are a new person. And God's telling you what to do. And you know what? Do it. You'll be a better person. You'll be a better person. Number three, God's anointing makes difficult tasks easier. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse number 6, from his unlimited resources, God will give you mighty inter inner strength through his Holy Spirit. You need to circle that word inner strength. Because what happens is we want external strength. There's a lot of things, ladies and gentlemen, that you're not going to be able to do. Okay? Ask Mark. There's a lot of things that Mark cannot do right now because he had COVID or COVID pneumonia. Okay, can't breathe. He has to stop. But guess what? You can stop the external strength, but you cannot stop the inner strength. The inner strength is not based upon my age. It is not based upon my resources that I have access to externally. My inner strength is based upon the, the resources that I have internally, which is God, which gives me everything. And may I say this to y'all? God doesn't run out of resources. Okay? So if God doesn't run out of resources, and God has planted his resources of the Holy Spirit inside of me and inside of you, then guess what? That's why we do Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ, which gives me strength. Why? Because he's given me the resources inside of me to do whatever it is he wants me to do. He does not call you based upon your abilities. He calls you based upon your availability. Are you ready? Will you do these things? So in Ephesians 3.16, he allows us to do these things. Again, Ephesians 4.13, I already told you about that one. I don't have to keep hammering that at you. Uh, how am I doing? Number four, God's anointing makes the impossible possible. 
Okay? Luke 18, 27. Look at what he says. What is possible for men or what is impossible for men is possible with God. I, can do, I can't do everything, but God can. Ephesians 3, 20. God's power at work within us is able to accomplish infinitely more than we could ever dare to ask for or even imagine. Even imagine. So what does he do? God anoints my life in your life. And you want to know why? To bless others. Not to bless ourselves, okay? And so, in, in Isaiah, he says that I, I know I am anointed, I'm anointed with God. And, and, and he, he talks about uh, six types of people, you know, that are, that are in pain and everything. And he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, has anointed me. He says, to bring good news to the suffering, to the afflicted. That's number one. Number two, he's anointed me to comfort the brokenhearted. He's anointed me to announce freedom to people who are captives. He, he says, to announce freedom to people who are enslaved. He has anointed me to open the eyes of the blind. He sent me to tell those who mourn that the time God's favor to, uh, to them has come. He, he says, he's, he's tell me all of these things. He says that God will give you beauty for ashes, joy instead of mourning, praise instead of heaviness. These are the things that God is saying, I've anointed you to do, to be able to do all of these things. And then he's, in Luke chapter 4, in, in chap, uh, verse number uh, 18, Jesus sits down and, and he tells them, he's reading Isaiah, the, chap, the, the scripture we were just reading, and here's what he says. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has appointed me to preach the good news to the suffering, afflicted the poor, he has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted. And you know what he says? He says, today this passage has been fulfilled. I'm the one. I'm the one. And he began to tell them, and I need, you need to understand, number six, for every new challenge, I need a fresh anointing. Every new challenge, I need a new one, okay? Look at the children of Israel that, that were in the, the wilderness, you know, for 40 days, okay? Um, and, and there's a whole bunch of things that we need to understand. And, and I just want to share a story with you about that when God anoints your business, it brings success. I was reminded uh, and the, these, when these two young ladies were talking to me this morning, they had no idea I was going to bring this up. But I uh, got two young ladies, and we were, I was asking them, you know, you got a job? And, and, and both of them told me they, they've applied for a job at Hobby Lobby. I don't know if you know much about Hobby Lobby. But let me tell you about Hobby Lobby. The guy's name is David Green. Him and his wife, they are the owners of Hobby Lobby. Hobby Lobby, back when um, the minimum wage was $7.50, you know how much Hobby Lobby was paying their, their people? $15.70. Hobby Lobby believes that they should only be open 66 hours a week, six days. They will never open on Sunday. They believe that the, their workers need time out to rest, be with their family, and be spiritually with their family. That's Hobby Lobby. Okay? Uh, back a few years ago, when the government was forcing corporations to provide insurance for abortions. Hobby Lobby took the government to the Supreme Court. Their money, their case, they won. How many of y'all uh, know a guy by the name of Rick Warren. Rick Warren started as a, a small Southern Baptist preacher. Opened a church in Orange County with where um, um, Chuck Swindoll was, uh, John MacArthur was, uh, the Crystal, 
cathedral was, all of these big, huge churches was out there. And he went in and, and, and uh, started this church. And, and in the beginning, it was uh, find us if you can, because every week they were having to move. Uh, they would outgrow their location. They started as, as a couple of small groups, him and his wife and a couple of couples, small groups, and, and it expanded. David Green, I, I think his name is David Green, if I remember right. But anyway, he believed so much in what Rick Warren, yeah, his name is David Green. He believed so much about what Rick Warren was, was doing that they were looking at a piece of land for 20, that was going to cost them $25 million. David Green, out of his pocket, gave them the money to buy that land, $25 million. David Green is, I don't know how much money he is worth today. But some people ask him, well, do you believe in tithing? He says, yeah, don't you? Well, they say, well, how much do you give? You know how much David Green said, this is when I w- will retire, and he's close to it. I will retire when I'm able to give 90% of my money to the Lord and only live on 10%. He's at 87.5% today. I believe it's the number that he gives away. When you walk into Hobby Lobby, a lot of the stuff that you will see will be spiritually oriented. Why? Because he believes that God anointed his business. His first business was selling a few little things out of the attic in his house and taking, putting it into a car and delivering it, okay? But you know what he said? He said, my business was my calling. That was my calling. And God anointed me to do that. And he says, and that's what I'll do. I will continue to do that, okay? Okay. Um, so when, when God anoints your business, it will be a success. Now, number two, and um, I hope they catch up with me. When, when God anoints your body, it brings health, okay? In Mark chapter 6, in verse number 13, it says, The disciples anointed with oil, those who were sick, and people were healed. There's, there's a lot of sicknesses in the world, and some people are ill because they've made bad choices, okay? Uh, I have type 2 diabetes. I didn't get it from my mom or my dad. I got it because I made bad choices. My bad choices were uh, in the morning, I, I would have to drive two hours from Camden, Ohio to Columbus, and and. And two hours up, two hours back, and a lot of times working in the very beginning, 10 to 12 to 14 hours. So you get 16 hours that are in there. And so when you start talking about 16 hours and you're not getting much sleep, you need energy. So what do I do? A lot of Coke and Reese cups. That was my energy. I would, honestly, I would, by the end of the day, I probably had, had drank somewhere close to 8 to 12 20-ounce bottles of Coke, okay? I won't, we won't even go to the, to the Reese cups. Some people, some people complain about their food bill. Mine was my snack meal, okay? Because that's what kept me going. And, and so I, I, I just was hyper. All the time, I couldn't sleep, you know, and all of this stuff and, and everything. And, and so I, I, told, I went to Diana and I says, you know, I really think I've got, I really think I've got sugar, really diabetic. And, and she says, there's no way. Look at, just look at you. And, and I said, well, yeah, you, you know, and just look at me. I said, but the, there's something wrong. I think I do. And, and I, I go into the doctor and they look at me and they say, there, there's no way. Well, we'll, we'll go ahead and, 
and, and we'll we'll stick you you know with a needle and and, and we'll take your, your your blood sugar level and so my blood sugar level was 588 and the doctor says how did you walk in here and i said on my feet no, how did you do that? I, I said, because if you were to take, you, you just picked my blood, but if you were to take and actually examine that blood, you would probably find it is laced with Coke and Reese cups because that is what kept me going. That's what kept me energized and everything. And, and, and so um, my body has paid the price for that, okay? Uh, I don't drink as much Coke, and I don't eat as many candy bars. Um, They told me uh, about 10 years ago that I would probably be on insulin within about six months. That's 10 years ago. Still not on insulin. I'm still, my sugar is still controlled with with, with, uh, my blood. Uh, I still eat what I want to eat. Will I die early? Yeah. Instead of making it to 120, I'm probably going to die at 99. You know, and that's cool. I'm, I'm okay with that, you, you know, because I don't, I don't want to be the oldest person in the world and all my friends are gone. Okay, that, that, that'll that happen next year. Okay, and, and, and sometimes we, we need to understand the sicknesses and the illnesses and things that are there. And and so I, I say this to to you. In John chapter 11, verse number 4, and Jesus says this, the purpose of his illness is not for death, but instead the purpose of his illness is so that God will receive glory from his situation. There are things that are going on in your life, and, and, and so many times you, you just won't allow God to step in. And what God wants to do it's, it's just, say, listen, get out of the way for a minute. Just get out of the way for a minute, and let me handle this. And when he does, all of a sudden there's this healing that comes. And then it's like, why didn't I do this a long time ago? Why didn't I just get out of my way and just allow him to take over? And so what I'm saying to you this morning is this. There are people that you know that are hurting right now. They're not telling you. And they don't need to tell you. But there's people outside this door. They're struggling. And all they ask is maybe why don't you just walk up to them and say, listen, you know what? I don't know what's going on right now in your life. But can I just pray for your healing? Can I just pray for you? I I don't need to know what it is. Can I do that? I'm a firm believer that we don't see a lot of healing because we don't do a lot of praying and we don't do a lot of believing. Now, my number one pet peeve, and, and, and I, I don't want to offend anybody by this, okay? But you'll have people say, I've got an unspoken request. I can't really pray for your unspoken request. The only thing I can pray is, God, whatever it is, 
have your way. That's all. Okay? That's all I can do. But, but, if you tell me very specifically what your unspoken request is, you know what I can do? I can take and pray for you very specifically for that request. And you know what the Bible says about that one? If any two of you will agree as touching any one thing, and if you'll pray in my name and ask, he says, it will be done. That's why I, and, and don't get offended, but that's why I'll ask you sometimes, tell me exactly what it is. Because, hey, pray. I get people all the time get mad at me. Hey, will you pray for my lost loved ones? Sure will. What's their name? Well, I don't want to give you the name. Then I can't pray for them. Do you know who they are? Well, yeah. Then tell me who they are. I'm not going to put it on Facebook. You know, I'm just taking it to God. And, and that's what he wants us to do. We've got an anointing God has on our lives, ladies and gentlemen. And the anointing that he's got on our lives says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The reason we don't see a lot of movement is because we don't believe it. It's little verses. And again, I had, a, I had an epiphany, a, a, a moment when I, was, when I was doing some studying this week, and I came across Zechariah chapter 3 and as I was going through there and, and just opened the Bible up, and, and there it was. And I'm sitting there, and I'm reading this. I'm thinking, whoa, yes, Satan. I am dressed in nothing but trash and rags. And I am standing before God with nothing. Nothing, absolutely nothing. And Satan is accusing me of everything. And God is saying, give him another robe. Let's take that dirty stuff off. And let's put a turban on his head. And let's anoint him. Because he is my child. And Who's he doing it? He's doing it right in the front of Satan, who is the accuser of the brethren. He may be the accuser of the brethren, but God is the lover of the brethren. And he's not accusing me of anything. He already knows what I do. He doesn't have to accuse me of anything. He already knows. You know what? He still loves me. 